Wow. Great job. Boy, I really enjoyed that. Wasn't that awesome? <laughs> Praise God. You know, as they sang those songs, I was reminded of a psalm that David had written. He said, the Lord, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and those who run into it are saved. Just imagine being surrounded by the Lord. Christ himself protects you and me. We know him. We seek to follow him. He is our protector. This morning, we're going to continue our series called Heroes of Faith. And uh, if you remember, last week, we, we opened up by talking about Abraham. Abraham is the father of faith. Abraham is the example in Scripture to us of what it means to believe. And you remember the key verse we talked about was in Genesis 15 where it says that Jesus, or excuse me, that, that Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him unto righteousness. And, and by that very verse in the Old Testament, old, the, the Father Abraham set the example for us of what it means to believe and the benefits that come to us when we believe. Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him unto righteousness. We talked about how that we have this long list of debits against us, sins that we have committed, our, our account before God. We are bankrupt, and in fact, not only are we bankrupt, it's full of all kinds of things that we have done wrong, but God says that when we believe in his son Jesus, he wipes all of that clean. As far as the east is from the west, he separates our sin from us, and what does he do? He deposits righteousness into our account. So when you trust in Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you can stand before a holy God knowing that even though you are sinful and imperfect, God gives you the gift of righteousness. It's incredible. It's the most incredible gift that we could ever hope to receive from God, but he does that for us. This week, this week, we're going to continue the series and we're going to talk about, you remember, you see, Paul said that those examples in Scripture that, he get, that God gave us are a picture to us for us to use in our own lives. They are examples, both good and bad, of what we are to follow. So we are to be like Father Abraham. We are to be like Abraham and to believe God and know that he gives us righteousness when we trust in his son Jesus. That's the promise. That's the promise in the New Testament. So that Abraham is an example to us of faith. This morning, though, we're going to talk about the life of Joseph. The story of Joseph from the book of Genesis, Genesis 37 through 50. 30, there are 13 chapters deal with this life of this unique man named Joseph. And I want to kind of briefly tell you the story about Joseph, just to remind you of that. Um, Joseph, to me, sets the example for us in Scripture of what it means to spiritually endure. Have you ever been at one of those points in your life where you're just like, Lord, I, I can't do this anymore. The pain that I feel right now is just too much. I want to give up. It hurts too much. Joseph is an example to you this morning of how you can carry on. Remember the story about Joseph. Joseph was the favorite son. He was, he was born, he was the 11th son of, of uh, Isaac, or excuse me, uh, uh, jo Abraham, Isaac, Israel. Excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, I got them all mixed up there. So he was, he was the 11th son of Israel. And if you remember, Israel had uh, two wives and two concubines, and from that he ultimately had 12 children, or really 12 sons and at least one daughter that we know of, okay? But here's the weird thing. Out of those 11 sons, Jacob, or excuse me, uh, out of those 11 sons uh, from Jacob, Israel, Joseph was the 11th one, and he was born from Rebekah. He was the only son from Rebekah, and Rebekah was um, 
Joseph or Jacob's all these names. Sorry, <laughs> get them confused here. He was the fa- she was the favorite wife. Now let me just stop there for a second. I, I hope you didn't experience this in your own life, but have you ever seen a family where there's a child, someone in that family who maybe is a favorite son or daughter? You want to mess something up? You want to get dysfunction going in your life? That's the way to do it. Have a favorite son or daughter. The Bible is full of examples of families who, who had that trait, that characteristic. And, and, and nothing came out of that that was any good. Because there's something wrong about favoring one child over another. We're to equally love our children. And when you, when you maybe gravitate toward one kid and you love them more than you love the others, and, it, and it's obvious to the others, oh man. That is, that is a source of all kinds of problems. You remember how it goes? Joseph was the favorite son of Jacob, his father. And he gave him this multicolored tunic. It was a symbol to everyone else that he was his favorite son, that he loved him. You see, he didn't give that to every son. No, no, no. He just gave it to Joseph. Guess what happened? The other sons, they hated him. They knew you're our dad's favorite son, and we hate you for it. Now, let's add insult to injury. Joseph is someone, for some reason, who God has chosen to use, and he gifts him with the ability to dream. He he receives these dreams from God. And the dreams essentially say this, that all of you brothers... And even my dad will one day bow before me. The youngest son telling the rest of the family, hey, guess what? You're going to be beholden to me. And they hated him even more. You see, he was basically saying, I'm superior to you. I'm going to be in charge. I'm going to rule over you. So what happened? One day, Joseph was close to his dad and his other brothers were out taking care of all the livestock and they had wandered off into a farther city and he gave Joseph the responsibility. He said, Joseph, go find out how your brothers are doing. So he sends him off. Joseph goes off to find them and from a far distance away, they saw this person, the brothers saw this person coming. You know how they knew it was Joseph? Because he was wearing the multicolored And they said, here comes our brother. And the hate within them rose up in their heart. And they said, let's kill him. Let's get rid of him. He makes me angry. I want him dead. Now, fortunately, he had one brother who rose up to try to defend him. And he persuaded the others, essentially, to say, look, don't kill him. We don't want his blood on our hands. What we do need, though, is to get rid of him. So let's sell him into slavery. They had thrown him in a pit. They came when he finally came. They took him captive. They threw him in a pit. And then this party of people headed off to Egypt came by, and they said, let's sell him into slavery. And that's what they did. They sold him into slavery. We know part of that extra story, what happened? Potiphar. A man who was the captain of Pharaoh's guard came along and he saw value in this young man, this talented, good-looking guy. And he said, I'll buy him. He's going to be my slave. He put him into his household. And what did he do? He actually became very successful. God blessed Joseph while he was there working for Potiphar. But we know the rest of the story, right? Potiphar, Potiphar had this wife and she decided she wanted Joseph for herself. And so she tried to seduce him. She tried to get him. And he kept refusing, refusing. He would not do it. He was in charge of Potiphar's whole household. And he didn't want any part of that. He knew that would bring destruction upon himself. And so what did she do? She framed him. She, she framed him. She made it look like he had come in to seduce her. And in fact, it was really her doing the situation and what happened. He, he brought, she screamed and she brought the guard in and she explained to, to them what had happened and she framed Joseph and the next thing you know, Potiphar is full of rage and he throws Joseph into prison. Now let me just stop for a second. Imagine what it would have been like 2,000 years before Christ was born 
to be in an Egyptian prison. You think it's bad now. (laughs) You know, you don't want to spend time in an Egyptian prison now, right? Back then, no running water, no heat, no cold, probably little food. An Egyptian prison, you go from being your father's favorite son, now you're in the pit of an Egyptian prison, dirty, filthy, smelly, with the worst kinds of people in the world. How do you think Joseph felt at this point? He had gone from being the most important son to now the pit of despair. And you remember what happened. Joseph is there in prison for a considerable amount of time, and then suddenly something happened. It looked like an opportunity to him. The cupbearer, the king's cupbearer, who gives wine to the king, and the baker, the one who feeds Pharaoh, they are thrown into prison for some kind of an offense. They are both thrown in prison. And Joseph, who has now become prominent within the prison, becomes familiar with these men. He hears their stories, and they also have a dream, which he later interprets. And he says to the cupbearer, in three days, basically, you're going to go free. You're going to be restored to your former position. But you, sorry, baker, three days, you're going to be hanged. Sure enough, it happens just as Joseph had interpreted the dream. And he had told the cupbearer, remember me when you get back into your position of prominence. But the man forgot all about Joseph until one day, two years later, Joseph is still rotting in prison. And the Pharaoh has a dream. He has two dreams. Both dreams mean essentially the same thing. And they're a prediction of what God is going to do, that God is going to send great well-being and feast upon the land of Egypt for seven years but then following that seven years of famine far more worse than the years that had been good and the people who were brought before the Pharaoh to try and interpret the dream they didn't know the meaning of the dream they couldn't come up with the answer but the the cupbearer remembered oh yeah there's a guy there's this Jewish guy in prison And he can interpret dreams, call for him. And so Joseph is brought before Pharaoh. And what happens? Joseph gives the interpretation to Pharaoh of dreams. And sure enough, Joseph goes from the worst despair to the greatest situation you could possibly imagine. He is suddenly put in a position of authority over all of Egypt. He is second in command over all of Egypt except for Pharaoh himself. And then his past comes back upon him. Severe famine comes in the land and his brothers who are still living up in Canaan at this point with their father father Israel, Jacob, they have this severe famine and they're told by Jacob to go down into the land and buy grain because that's the only place on the earth at this point really that has any grain because Egypt had prepared well for the famine that was coming. And so they went down, and not knowing it, they go before Joseph, their brother, who they had tried to kill and sold into slavery. And Joseph, really, now he's an older young man, probably in his 30s, prominent, looks different to them. They don't recognize him. They seek to buy grain from him. He sells them grain, but he creates a situation where they are caught off guard and he finds a way to put them in a difficult situation where they have to come back to him. He keeps one of his brothers there until they go and get his other brother Benjamin and bring him back to Egypt. Ultimately, here's the final thing, that the family was finally reunited. And they did just as Joseph had originally dreamed, that they they one day bowed before him. They one day bowed before him, even Israel, Joseph's father. But what I want you to see in all of this is this, is that there was a time and a place in Joseph's life where he experienced the ups and downs of life. And at the very end of Genesis, he has this incredible perspective on things. He's able to look back and say, Wow, look at what God has done in my life. And here's his perspective. Genesis 50, 20. 
As for you, he's talking to his brothers who were fearful now that Israel, their father, had died. They were fearful that Jacob would finally carry out his wrath on them because of what they had done to him. And he says, no, 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 you don't understand, guys. He said, here's the right perspective. This is the perspective that God has finally given me after all of this time. He says, as for you, you meant evil. When you intended to throw me in the pit or kill me or sell sell me into slavery, you meant it for evil against me. But God meant it for good in order to bring about the present result to preserve many people. Now, how many of us can say that when we are going through the ups and downs of life, that we can have that kind of perspective? How is it possible that we could have that kind of perspective? Folks, that is painful. You see, that is a a perspective that comes after years of struggle and pain. Being hated by your brothers, being thrown away, cast into slavery, being put in a prison, an Egyptian prison, You could easily have a grudge. You could easily hold a grudge and say, the next time I see those guys, they're gone. They're mine. I'm going to get rid of them. But he didn't have that perspective. You see, Joseph had been through the ups and downs of life. And he knew that ultimately God was in control of his life and your life. Let me share this quote with you. I love this quote. And I, you know, I bet I bet Joseph would agree with this quote. Pain is temporary. Quitting is forever. Pain is temporary, but quitting is forever. What if Joseph had given up somewhere along the way? What if Joseph had said, that's it, I'm done. No more God. I'm not trusting you, Lord. I'm not relying upon you. I quit. God's purpose in that man's life would have stopped. And here's the amazing thing. This is is where we're headed with this message. That when you quit, those whom you would influence, those whom you would essentially save, they die too. You see, the result of Joseph's life was that God had used him in such a way where he put him in charge of the nation that literally would save the world from famine. Had Joseph quit along the way because he said, you know what, this hurts too much. I just reject it all. I just give it up. What would that have done? Millions of people would have died as a result of that. We need spiritual endurance, folks. I know many of y'all. I I know many of y'all now. And I know some of the stuff that you go through you and I need spiritual endurance because we go through the ups and downs of life turn with me over to first Peter 5 I want to I want you to just listen to these words that Peter told New Testament believers in the in the New Testament first Peter 5 I'm going to begin at the end of that that Uh, verse verse 5 it says God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you at the proper time does that sound like Joseph does to me Casting all your anxiety on him if you're here this morning and you have struggles I know you do I know your stories I know some of you're going through you have struggles cast all your anxiety on him because why because he cares for you because he loves you be a sober spirit be on the alert your uh, your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour but look here's what we're called to do resist him firm in your faith Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world. After, look at this. This is Joseph. This is Joseph's story. This is Joseph's example to us to endure. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who calls you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself perfect, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion and for, forever and ever. 
Amen. Turn with me over to Hebrews chapter 10, verses 32 But remember the former days when after being enlightened you endured a great conflict of sufferings, partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated. For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully. Listen to this. These are are New Testament Christians You accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Imagine that. You claim to be a Christian. You you hold on to the name of Jesus, and people come and they say, we don't like you. Matter of fact, we hate you, and we're going to take your stuff. Would you be willing to suffer for Christ that much? Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of what? Endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my, look, look at this, folks. Here it is. This is the endurance. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the perseverance of the soul. You and I are like Joseph. We go through highs and we go through lows in life. We do. I mean, it might be cancer. It might be the loss of a job. It might be a broken relationship. Maybe your marriage or a broken relationship between one of your children. What? Life can throw so much at you. It's just overwhelming sometimes. You're just like, Lord, I can't, I can't do this anymore. I'm just tired. I'm worn out. What do I do? What do I do? Endure endure consider it all joy brethren when you encounter various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance i'm not going to go into it but trust me when i say this i've been through a lot of stuff i'm not exempt from that i've had a lot of pain in my life various things in various ways And by the grace of God, somehow he's allowed me to endure. Joseph is a great example of endurance. You can be a great example of endurance. You and I can endure. I can remember one time being in the Houston airport, Houston Hobby Airport, and thinking to myself, I'm not going to make it one more day. (laughs) I just had all I could take. And somehow God brought me through that. He brought me through it. And he can do that for you. You see, God is aware of your difficulties. God knew Joseph when he was stuck in an Egyptian prison. And he knows you wherever you're stuck right now. He does. He knows. He knows every hair on your head. He knows every thought before you even have it. He knows your greatest hopes and desires and your dreams. He doesn't want to snuff you out. He wants you to trust him. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Those who run into it are saved. Don't trust in men. Trust in God. Trust in Christ who is our strength. He will strengthen you. This life that I live, I no longer live on my own, but I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me. He loved you so much that he died for you. Will he surely not help you? If you're stuck in an Egyptian prison right now, don't quit. Don't give up. Do not give up. I don't care how much pain there is. Do not give up. You will make it through. God is faithful. He will bring you through. You must learn to pace yourself. 
Now I want to show you this brief video. It's about two minutes long. And it's a beautiful story of a 61-year-old man who did something that I wouldn't even dream of doing. His name is Cliff Young. He was Australian. And he, he coined, or actually they coined a phrase about him. He became one of the greatest marathon runners of all time at age 61. And he did something that no one has really ever done before. And he did it so well, they coined the phrase, the Cliff Young Shuffle. Let's watch that film for just a second. Now, when I say elite sportsman, you automatically think of a 61-year-old potato farmer wearing gumboots, don't you? Sometimes you have events that sort of uh, tickle a nation's funny bone or something grabs their attention. And with Cliff Young, it, sort of, it appealed to us on so many different levels. And he used to run in gumboots. He was the worst dressed sports person we've ever had. These days, of course, you know, Nike would have been there getting very special slip on boots. Cliff Young was, as his name suggested, young at heart. He embodied the never-say-die attitude many aspire to, but few achieve. What the interesting thing about Cliff Young is, is that he wanted to do it. And it was remarkable what he did. I mean, he didn't cheat, he actually did it. Oh, I can't run. The hill's all away. You're here anyway. And day after day, Cliffy Young, the Cliff Young shuffle, and the whole nation fell in love with Incredibly, at age 61, Cliff became the oldest marathon winner and he took two days off the previous Sydney to Melbourne race record. Do you think that you're going to make it all the way? Oh, yeah. Well, sure. I'm going to run all night tonight and I'll hope to finish tomorrow. Tomorrow night, somehow. And he strutted the field. He just ripped them wide right open. Kept going to Melbourne. If they hadn't stopped him, he would have finished in Perth. Cliff was awarded the first prize of $10,000. He promptly gave two grand to each of the five other runners and kept nothing for himself. An impressive and generous man, that Cliff. Cliff, will you do it again? Will you do it again? Oh, no, I don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> now, how about that for a story? Isn't that amazing? 61 years old, he ran almost 600 miles and beat the record by almost two days. Incredible. You know how he did it? You know what his secret was? So it's the story of the tortoise and the hare, right? The hare runs fast, okay? Well, the, the, the other five runners, what they would do is they would run for 18 hours and they would sleep for six hours. You know what he did? He didn't sleep. He ran and he ran and he ran. Now, now, just to get this so you know how he did it, he was born in Australia and he was born as a, a, a cattle and a sheep herder. So he didn't have a vehicle. He came from a poor family. And so everywhere he went, when he herded his cattle or his sheep, he ran. He just ran. He just ran and ran and ran and ran. He never stopped. Imagine that. Incredible. But to win probably the, the most difficult endurance race you know, that maybe exists in the world today, uh, Sydney to Melbourne, Australia, almost 600 miles. He was behind up until the fifth night. But after the fifth night, he had just kept running so long, he just, he just finally, he kept going. He didn't stop. He didn't sleep. He just kept on running. He finally eventually passed him and beat him, beat him really bad. But here's the point. He endured. Now, you know, okay, let's just be honest here. If you run 600 miles in five days, folks, there's going to be some point in that race that you're going to want to give up. You're going to want to quit. Okay, I would have quit after about the fourth mile. <laughs> right? I hate running. <laughs> I'm not a good runner. Okay? But imagine that. He endured. Jesus endured. You know that? Jesus endured the cross. Hebrews says that, that there is a great cloud of witnesses around who look down at us and are encouraging us to go on. Why? They're telling us, fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of faith, who endured the cross and despised the shame, and now sits down at the right hand of God the Father. 
Jesus endured the cross. He knew that there was pain ahead, but he went through it. He didn't try to go around it. He didn't go over it or under it. He went through it. And that is what God, I believe, is telling you and me to do. We must endure. We must endure. God is faithful. I love 1 Corinthians 10, 13. God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tested beyond what you are able, but with the temptation, with the testing, provide a way of escape he will do that he is faithful he is faithful he is a strong tower and I want you to think about this too this is significant because don't forget the story of Joseph you see ultimately when Joseph endured all that he had to endure he spent all that time being sold into slavery and being thrown in an Egyptian prison and all of those kinds of horrible things that are bound to have happened to him in the midst of that. Ultimately, God used him to save, we don't know how many, but he saved thousands and thousands and thousands of people from starvation. God put him in a position to do that. Now, you and I are not going to be second in command to Pharaoh. That's not what God intends for your life. But who will you save by your endurance? What child or grandchild will you set an example for? They will one day look when you're gone and they'll say, you know what? I became a Christian because my grandmother loved and prayed for me. I became a Christian because my grandfather was faithful. He endured even when he was out of a job, when he had health problems. Who are you going to be a witness to? Who are you going to be an example to that will then be encouraged to endure just like you did? Endure. You know, I'm sure there are times when right now you just feel like, Lord, (laughs) help me. I'm just barely hanging on. I've tied a knot at the end of that rope and I'm hanging on. But God is a strong tower. Christ is a strong tower. You can run into him and find protection, find peace, find hope to endure. Let's pray.